Have you ever soldered a joint so terrible it makes you just want to throw your whole board right away? Well, before you do that, let me show you how to fix those mistakes and give you the right soldering techniques so that never happens ever again. Starting out, we need to decide if we're working on a blank proto board or a custom PCB, either from a kit or one that we've designed and then had fabricated by a company like PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. For learning, prefabricated PCBs are great because all you really need to do is take your components, drop them into place and get to soldering. Once the component's in place, we're gonna flip the board over and bend the legs outwards to prevent it being pulled out by gravity. A universal rule for soldering is that the components should lay flush on the board and not be floating up in the air. If they're left up in the air floating around, they can wiggle a lot and eventually snap off, especially in high vibration environments, such as like a vehicle, like a car or a robot. Great, so what's the actual technique for soldering? This video builds on my previous one about splicing and soldering wires. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out first. It covers safety, tool maintenance, and the core techniques for good heat transfer. To avoid repetition, I won't dive deep into those topics here. Instead, let's get right to it. Crank your soldering iron up to 650 degrees Fahrenheit and turn on your fume extractor. With the iron hot, I'm gonna start by tinning the tip with a small amount of solder. This just helps prevent surface oxidization. Then I'll clean the tip using a brass sponge. Good soldering is all about heating up the work surface first and then adding fresh solder. To do this effectively, you need to heat both the component leg and the annular ring at the same time. Notice how I hold the iron at a shallow angle allowing the side of the iron to touch both surfaces. This sweet spot on the side of the iron maximizes heat transfer and is far more effective than just using the tip of the iron. A little bit of pro advice, always keep a tiny bit of solder on the tip. It helps improve thermal conductivity and makes soldering so much easier. With the iron covered in a little solder, position the sweet spot to heat the joint. Once heated, apply fresh solder to the opposite side. The heat will pull the solder in, allowing it to flow smoothly around the joint and forming a strong electrical connection. When finished, your solder joint should have a smooth conical volcano shape. Use flush trim cutters to cut off the excess legs and try and get in as close to the joint as possible. I recommend holding on to the leg when cutting as they have a tendency to shoot off and could hit you in the eye pretty easily. So, putting it all together in a quick recap. Step one, clean the iron. Then add a little bit of solder to the sweet spot and orient the iron so that the solder bowl is touching both the leg and the PCB pad. Once heated, apply fresh solder from the other side of the joint. With that, you've got a solid professional solder joint. But let's talk about some of the common mistakes and how you can avoid them. One of the most common and frustrating mistakes, heating only the component leg and not the annular ring. This creates a cold solder joint, which might look fine to begin with, but eventually it will fail. Always ensure both surfaces are evenly heated up before adding solder. Another issue is adding too much or too little solder. Drag any excess up the leg and then snip it off or scoop it off with your iron and then brush it in the sponge. If there's not enough solder on the joint, the connection will be weak. So just add more until the joint is fully covered. When soldering a row of pin, excess solder can create unwanted bridges between them. To fix this, Use a tiny bit of solder on your iron, position it between the legs, and then drag the iron through like you're slicing butter. The green solder mask repels the solder and it'll pull back toward the annular ring. You can also use a solder pump to remove the excess, but more on that a little bit later. And here is the biggest mistake of all, 
applying a big blob of solder to the tip of the iron and trying to paint it on to cold components. It just doesn't work. The solder won't bond properly and you'll end up with a weak connection. Always heat the joint first and then apply fresh solder. This graphic summarizes the common pitfalls. But what if you need to remove a component after it's been soldered? You'll either need a solder pump or a copper wick. Copper wick absorbs unwanted solder via capillary action. To use it, hold the wick by the plastic casing as the copper itself will get very, very hot. Then apply a small amount of solder to the tip of the iron and heat the copper while it's positioned on top of the joint. Give it time to melt and draw the solder into the braid. It seems counterintuitive, but adding fresh solder to the tip of the iron before desoldering really helps. The liquid solder improves heat transfer, making removal easier. And if you're still struggling, try adding some flux to the wick, as that'll also help the solder flow. In some cases, you may need to wick solder from both sides of the board, but eventually once the solder is removed and the legs are loose, you should be able to pull the component free. After using the wick, trim the used section so that you have fresh copper ready for next time. Overall, the copper wick can be pretty tricky to use. That's why my default choice is to reach for the solder pump. Also known as a solder sucker, this tool creates a vacuum to pull up liquid solder. Prime it by pushing the plunger down, then heat the joint until the solder melts. Remove the iron quickly and position the pump over the melted solder, forming a tight seal around the joint. And then release the plunger. If the hole isn't fully cleared, try adding more solder and desoldering again. Sometimes refilling the hole makes it easier to remove everything in one clean go. Using both the iron and the pump on the same side of the board can be tricky. If you're struggling to get a good seal, try working from opposite sides. I'll add a little bit of solder to my iron, heat the joint from one side, wait for it to bubble and boil on the other, and then use the pump to remove the solder. Once the holes are clear, the component should pull out easily. A word of caution when you're out shopping, a lot of the cheap pump options that you'll find have these solid plastic tips to them. And honestly, they're just not worth the money. Spend a little bit more on a pump with a silicone tip as it creates a much tighter seal and pulls out the solder more effectively. Links to the tools that I'm using are down in the description below. If you don't have a solder pump or wick, there are a few other ways to remove components. The first is for components that have two legs nearby each other, like LEDs, you can heat both up at the same time and then pull them out with a pair of pliers. For components with wider leg spacing, like resistors, use a flathead screwdriver to lever one leg out at a time. And if you don't care about saving the component, you can simply chop off all the legs and then clear the holes individually one by one. For components like ICs with a lot of legs, desoldering can be incredibly frustrating. To avoid this situation entirely, use an IC socket instead. These sockets stay permanently attached to your circuit board, but allow you to easily swap out the chips anytime you need. You'll even find IC sockets on boards like the Arduino Uno. Likewise, when I'm soldering microcontrollers onto a circuit board, I'll sometimes use female header pins so that the microcontroller can be later removed if needed. If you need to solder header pins onto a breakout board that doesn't come pre-soldered, a breadboard makes a great frame to keep the pins perfectly straight. And if I did need to solder pins onto this Arduino Uno shield, for example, I'd use the Uno itself as a frame in the exact same way. For components with legs that can't easily be bent, you can hold them in place with heat-resistant capped-on tape, or in cases like this switch, 
I use blue tack to hold it down in position. Just note that blue tack does tend to get kind of gummy when exposed to heat, so let it cool down before removing it. What about soldering wires onto a PCB? It seems pretty simple, right? We can just use the same process as before. And this will work at first, but a small tug on the cable or too many bends back and forth and the connection will eventually snap off. To prevent this, hot glue can act as a viable strain relief, but even better, use a board to wire connector like a JST plug or this screw terminal for a secure, long lasting connection. And just like that, I have a fully assembled PCB ready to power up this LED strip. But how can you make a board like this for yourself? I had this one fabricated by PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. PCBWay is a fabrication service I use regularly because they offer high quality and affordable PCBs with fast turnaround times. I designed this board in Fusion 360, exported it as a Gerber zip file, then uploaded it to pcbway.com. For just $5 plus shipping, I got 10 custom boards delivered to me fast. I can't imagine doing half my projects without the circuit boards that PCBWay helps me fabricate. So when you're ready, head over to PCBWay to bring your design to life. Custom PCBs are just amazing, but what if you're looking to throw something together really quickly as just a proof of concept or maybe a one-off project? That's where something like a proto board comes into play. Proto boards are great for rapid prototyping as they act as a blank canvas with a grid of isolated holes where you can drop components in freely and make all the connections yourself manually however you want. For neighboring connections, bend the legs to touch creating a solid solder joint. But do keep in mind that the solder tends to flow in the direction of the leg. So don't try bending the legs in opposite directions if you actually intend to connect them together. For slightly longer connections, use the component leg itself as a bridge. Optionally, you can coat the entire leg in solder, but this is usually unnecessary unless you anticipate there to be a high current running through the system. Trying to bridge connections using just the annular rings is very frustrating and rarely ever works. Instead, I use the leg of a donor resistor to span the gap. Solder one end, then the other, and trim. For far apart connections, solid core jumper wire works best. Bend the wire at 90 degree angles to fit your layout. I like to use my fingernail to indent where the insulation needs to be stripped. And then once I have it cut to length, I can reinstall it and solder. With that, you're ready to start assembling your own circuit boards. If you haven't seen it yet, go check out my video on splicing wires together. Consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next one.